I'm David Dixon. And I'm Father Doug Scharf. Welcome to Sunday Ready. We are going to share with you about the readings for this coming Sunday, June 20th. And they are from the Old Testament, Job 38, 1 through 11, Psalm 107, verses 1 through 3, and 23 through 32. The epistle reading comes once again from Paul's letter, 2 Corinthians, chapter 6, 1 through 13. And finally, the gospel from the gospel of Mark, chapter 4, 35 through 41. Well, uh, welcome back, everybody. Uh, it's good to be back with you this this week. And um, if you're just joining us for the first time, or you've watched some old podcasts, we've been uh, where we're going to start for the for the at least foreseeable future to kind of change the way we uh, look at the readings and uh, start with the gospel reading because it connects thematically with all of the other readings um, appointed for the day. So we're going to kick things off with Mark chapter four. 35 through 41, where Jesus says to his disciples, let us go across to the other side. That's a sermon right there, David. <laughs> it is a sermon, right? <laughs> Tell that's us like, what's on the, what's on the other side, David. What's on the other side. That's it. I like it. Uh, it's almost like Jesus is saying, You've seen one side of me, but I'm going to show you another side you've not yeah. seen yet, right? <laughs> yeah. It's, and it's, it's awesome. This story is one of my favorite uh, accounts in the gospel, particularly the gospel of Mark. Um, they get in the boat. Of course, they're going across uh, the water and a storm comes. And where is Jesus? <laughs> he is asleep. Yeah. <laughs> he is not awake. Everyone else is woke up and fearful. Jesus is asleep and they wake Jesus up. And uh, of course he speaks to the wind and the storm. I, I like the idea that sometimes the storms come into our life to cause Christ to arise, mm -hmm. to cause the person of, of Christ that is in us to stand up um, and to be able to begin speaking uh, in those storms of life uh, that we encounter and that we face. It's, you know, it's a storm. It says they were already being swamped. I think King James said that the waves were covering the boat. You know, yeah. uh, you feel, you know, totally like you are in over your head sometimes in life. Yeah. And it's in those moments that God makes God's self real. Yeah. Well, and I like that you said, you know, Jesus said, you've seen one side of me. Let me show you another side of me. And, and it was his mission. Um, he, he had been doing his work primarily on the western side of the Sea of Galilee, um, you know, uh, uh, Jewish uh, territory. Um, you know, people kind of knew um, generally what he was talking about, although not always. Um, but going over to the other side was Gentile territory, right? And um, and 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 it, it, part of what made people upset was the fact that Jesus was expanding the boundaries of the kingdom of God. And yet, when when the disciples were called to this new mission, this new place, the first thing they encounter is a storm, right? And and how often does that happen in our life where we feel like, you know, we're pursuing what God wants us to do? Jesus has called them. Let us go over, over to the other side. They're being obedient to that. And they, they encounter this storm in their right. life. Yeah. And the question uh, he gives is, why are you afraid? Yeah. It's almost, uh, it's almost a challenge uh, to us to say, we believe that what God has said is true. Yeah. So I don't need to be afraid. Yeah. In the midst of it, even though I have reason, right, um, to be afraid. Yeah. We don't have to be afraid because we have God's word. That's right. Well, and the final question, who is this that even the wind and the waves obey him? I love the gospel of Mark because it doesn't come right out and say, like the gospel of John, bam, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. You just want to know who Jesus is right away. Right. But in Mark, there is this process of discovery. Mm -hmm. 
And it's through these questions that the disciples ask. And it's a rhetorical question, but everybody knows the answer um, because in the Jewish worldview, only the God of Israel had authority and sovereignty over the elements of creation itself. So right. the implied answer is, who is this that has authority over the wind and the waves? Only God. And so that's part right. of what they start wrestling with is here is this human being, Jesus, in our midst, and right. he's doing the things that only God should be able right. to do. And right. you know where that's going to like go, it. right? That's great. Um, so that takes us to the Old Testament, uh, thir Job 38, because... Um, you know, if you know anything about the book of Job, um, God allows Satan to take, wipe out everything, his family, his land, his crops, his animals, everything to see how Job will respond in terms of his faith. Right. And Job goes through this, this extended period of wrestling with his own response. And these, these, his three friends come and they offer counsel and then Job responds and you know, their counsel represents, the counsel of the friends represents sort of the standard answers of the day, right? These were the standard theological answers. And none of them are, are really resonating with Job, no. right? He's like, yeah, that's sort of true. But, and how often does that happen in our life? Someone comes along and says, well, everything happens for a reason, right? right. Or when God opens, he closes a door, he opens a window, you know? Right. And that's sort of what Job's friends were doing. And then finally, God comes and says, you know, this is just me being God, right? Right, right, exactly. I, I, I think that's right on. Yeah, I mean, Job, right, the man who, you talk about trouble on top of trouble. Um, the way the story reads is someone came to him and said, Job, the Sabaeans have fell upon your children and killed them all. And it says, and while he yet spake, another came and said, this happened. And while he yet spake, another, he couldn't even get through one trouble before the other trouble showed up on top of it. So this man represents anything and everything in life that we would possibly encounter and go through. Job is every man, right? Every human um, here. And I like how this particular chapter starts. The Lord, you know, Job is questioning God. Uh, where were you, God, whenever this was happening? Where were you whenever I called out? Where were you? I went to the North Country. You weren't up there. Where were you, God? And God answers out of the storm. Not when it's calm, not, not when it's peaceful, but in the midst of the storm, the whirlwind, God begins to speak to Job. And it's not that God is getting on to Job, right? Right. God is raising Job up to a different level so he can begin to see and understand something on a cosmic level, right, mm -hmm. at a higher level than just uh, your own particular experience and understand that God is sovereign. God is in control. Yeah. And, um, yeah, that's, that's just a powerful powerful image right here that we have of God. Well, I, I like that you pointed out that this comes um, out of the whirlwind, right? In the midst of the storm. And so you can see why this was paired thematically with right. the gospel reading, because you've got the storm, you've got this, this word spoken to Job about the sovereignty of God over the elements of creation. Um, and so it's sort of this answer to the question in Mark, who is this right. that even the wind and the waves obey? Well, Job, you know, this passage from Job is the answer to that question. Right. Um, it's, it's clearly um, the God of Israel. And it's not too long after this passage that, that Job comes to this place of acceptance and contentment, um, sort of acknowledging that, you know, there isn't, um, at least my reading of Job, the takeaway is, there isn't always an easy answer to right. why bad things happen, right? All of these kind of standard theological answers that Job's friends um, offered were not satisfactory. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you give and you take away, blessed be the name of the Lord. That's, right. that's, sort, of the, that's sort of Job's theological foundation. Right. And then everything gets restored yeah. at the end when he comes to that place of, of surrender. Right, it does. 
I, I like here as God is speaking, um, answering out of the whirlwind, what you find in the following verses are different uh, ways of measuring and setting boundaries on the things that God has created, mm -hmm. which to me says God has set boundaries. God has measured things out. That is, it's not without design, without purpose, without, um, uh, you know, all loosey goosey. You may be experiencing something, but it can only go so far, right? Uh, the, the flood can only go so far. God is still, in charge and in control. And that's a hard one. Like you were saying, how do you answer this question? Why, you know, um, well, you can't, there's really not a satisfactory answer for that. The only thing we can do is fall back on our faith and say, I trust God, <laughs> you know? Well, there was that famous book that came out a few years, well, many years ago. Now, why do bad things happen to good people written right. by a, a Jewish rabbi? And I read it as part of a book group a couple of years ago, and he essentially uses the book of Job as, as, as the frame for that book and basically comes to the same conclusion, um, kind of going through all of the standard responses and saying, you know, at some point we live with that mystery right. um, in terms of why, why suffering is, is, is what it is. Um, right. You know. Yeah. The problem of evil, right? The problem yeah. of evil. Yeah. Well, we're not going to solve that in this podcast. So uh, <laughs> let's let's uh, move on to Psalm 107. Um, uh, another song of praise and thanksgiving. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His mercy endures forever. Um, the psalm is connected thematically with the, the verses kind of later on where it talks about the people crying out to the Lord um, and, and the Lord stilling the storm and quieting the waves. So connecting to the imagery we have um, in the gospel reading. Yeah, I love the beginning of it. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good and his mercy endures forever. Let all those who are redeemed of the Lord say so, right? Yeah. <laughs> this is it, just say so. God is good. And yeah, there's a great uh, praise song from several years ago. Let the, re let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Yeah. That's right. Or if you've ever been in some of those uh, uh, black congregations, uh, one of the one of the call and responses that you may hear is God is good. And the audience will respond all the time, all the time. And then all the time God is God good. is good. Yeah. Yep. It's awesome. It's good. One one thing that's interesting, just just to note, is that in the psalm, the Lord speaks um, the, the storm into existence. Um, then he spoke and a stormy wind ar arose, which right. tossed the high wind, you know. So again, this this God is sovereign over the whole thing. You know, right. he he started the storm. He rescues from, from the storm. He calms the storm. I mean, God is God of all of it, um, right. which some people might find troubling. I find it really comforting to know that at no point is God not God. Right. 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 Absolutely. Um, that That is uh, that is comforting in so many ways. They cried to the Lord in their trouble and he delivered them from their distress. He stilled the storm to a whisper and quieted the waves of the sea. You know, there's that song um, that came out a few years back that sometimes uh, instead of calming the storm out here, God calms a storm in here, mm -hmm. right? That he speaks deliverance from my distress right here. It, it doesn't necessarily mean that everything is hunky dory in the world around me, but God has calmed my heart and calmed my spirit and spoken and whispered peace into my own soul so that I can go through whatever it is that I'm having to endure and having to face. Um, I did a lot of hiking uh, with our previous congregation. Uh, we were in the foothills of the Appalachian. And so we would go hiking. I worked with uh, the scout uh, troop that was there. And um, one of the mottos that they had, and it's also a model from Outward Bound, um, mm -hmm. is if you can't get out of it, get in it. <laughs> mm -hmm. So if you ever find yourself climbing or somewhere that you you're wanting to retreat, 
but guess what? You really can't. <laughs> you might as well just get in it, right? Yeah. So we, we come to those places in life where I can't get out of this. There's no way I can get out of it. So God says, let's get in it. Yeah. <laughs> and God goes with you in the middle of all of that. Yeah. Well, I actually think that's a great uh, transition to 2 Corinthians, because I think that's exactly what Paul goes through in this letter. Um, there, the, 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 to me, this letter, 2 Corinthians, is the most um, transparent Paul uh, mm. in terms of acknowledging his own weakness, acknowledging the hardships he's faced. He does it in other letters like Philippians and stuff, but he does it really to, to move quickly to we're prisoners of Christ for his glory. You know, it kind of moves very quickly. Where Second Corinthians, I like that. If you can't get out of it, get in it. I think he gets in it here, you know, and in this passage um, where he says, as servants of God, we have commended ourselves in every way through great endurance, inflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, um, uh, you know, ill repute, good repute. You know, he just goes through this whole litany right. of all the things that they've been immersed in. Um, and that really, again, not to sort of say, but glory to God, this is what has shaped yeah. Paul. Right. In terms of his apostolic ministry. And it shaped and continued to shape the early church and right. the following. I, I like how Paul says, we, 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 he, he's not just saying I, but we have experienced this together. We have gone through these things. And then you get down to uh, my favorite part of this is we are treated as imposters, yet not. <laughs> right. right. We are uh, dying, yet not we live. Yeah, I mean, it's this kind of yet, there's still this but, there's, there's this kind of interruption. We're going through this, but wait a minute, here's the reality. Here's yeah. something you need to keep in check, that we're dying, but we're alive. Yeah. We're, we're being uh, punished, but we've not been killed. You right. know, um, it's that kind of testimony uh, that you have endured and come through the test and, and life. Yeah. Life is a test. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, as you're saying that, what, what strikes me is going back to the beginning part of this passage where he says, um, now is the acceptable time. Now is the day of salvation. Right. Um, and for me, that means that living into the reality of God's promises, the promises of salvation um, is 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 always ha always has to be in the present tense, right? Um, yeah. It's it's not oh I was saved thirty years ago right. or um, you know one day I'll get my act together or something like that. It is every day right. is is a choice no matter what we're going through to say today is the day of salvation. Today, today. Right. absolutely. Something yeah. interesting about Paul too that I. Uh, I don't know, whenever I came to this uh, understanding or saw this and Paul's greetings and a lot of his letters, he has a few different salutations, right? He starts off some of them by saying, Paul, an apostle mm -hmm. of Jesus Christ. And then later on, you'll read him writing, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ. And then finally down towards the end, he says, Paul, a prisoner <laughs> of Jesus Christ. So it's all of those different experiences that shape the man, the person, Paul, which he is, again, here is saying to us, all of these things that we have experienced together is shaping us into the people of God. Right. Yeah. And I think to put it in the context of all the other readings, Paul is describing his storm. Yeah. Um, and if you keep reading through Second Corinthians, especially into chapters ten through to, through twelve, um, Paul is going to acknowledge that he can't he he cannot set himself free. Yes. Um, and so finally, you'll get to the point in the letter where he says, you know, my where God says to him, my power is made perfect in weakness. Right. Um, my grace is sufficient. And I think that for me is is kind of a, a thread that runs through this reading and all the other readings, these storms in the gospel, in, in Job's life, in the life of Israel described in the psalm, and now in Paul, um, are not things that we can 
get out of ourselves, right. we need a, we need a savior, right? We right. need, we need someone to rescue us. Absolutely. And of course that someone is Jesus. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Well, I think that's good for today. Good stuff. Good job, David. Thank you. Thank you, sir. (laughs) All right, everybody. Have a great week. We'll see you Sunday. And we hope that this podcast has in some small way helped you to be Sunday ready. Have a good one. See you.